What is it you want, Barry? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying times here. Come with me if you want to live. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. The Force will be with you. Always. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to 20th Century Geek. I'm your regular host, Scott Weatherly, and once again, I'm being joined by Brian. Brian, how you doing, mate? You okay? No faith but what we make, my friend. I'm doing great. How about you? <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing bad myself. I'm doing all right. And as you say, we are back to round out our Terminator retrospective with our current release. Well, I was going to say weekend of release, but current release review of Terminator Dark Fate. And uh, it's been interesting. I think this film's had a bumpy ride, I mm-hmm. think, to say, from the beginning. Yep. Um, and uh, its reception probably hasn't been as warm as some people, especially people at the studio <laughs> yeah, would have liked. Exactly. Um, but but what are your thoughts on this sort of uh, its reception and uh, how people have approached it? You know, it, it's it's one of those things where we um, you know, I, I was looking forward to it for a while and I was doing one of these things where I was avoiding all of the trailers and a lot of the commercials and mm-hmm. you know whenever possible you know and i think i saw a movie a while back uh, at the cinema and they and they had one of the early trailers so i'm like okay i'll i'll watch it you know obviously um you know i i was i was really jazzed about it i was really excited about it and there were concerns as early as july of 2019 and before about uh, the direction of this story uh, i know they released some promotional materials and there were some internet trolls that were saying stuff about the movie, but then mm. to escalate the matters, you had the director, Tim Miller, also throwing some more fuel in the fire because, you know, uh, that's kind of his nature. I think he's just very kind of like uh, intense Controver- and seems like yeah, controversial. Controversy creates cash, yeah. Yeah, you got that right, man. You know, uh, you got that right. So, um, you know, it's very interesting to see how it played out. I mean, I was hoping it would do well. Uh, we're not even talking about the story itself, but I mean, a- as a story, we want to see it kind of come back to its its full potential. This is the third mm. time they've tried to uh, relaunch a trilogy with the with the series. You know, starting basically with Terminator Salvation, mm-hmm. uh, continuing with, with Genesis, and with this one as well. And perhaps that's where they're having kind of an issue because maybe instead of having a self contained story, they're more looking towards a long term storytelling. And I just don't think fans are going along for the ride. What do you think? No, I think you're right. And I think there was, you say, I remember the, I remember that first trailer yeah. dropping. And when I saw it, I was like, okay, there's bits of this that look really cool. There's bits mm-hmm. I think look quite good. I'm excited for this. But there were hints in there of, I don't know, what I would call almost like compromise. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was a bit like, okay, I'm not going to get too excited. You know, I've got sort of like, I'm going to damp my expectations. Mm-hmm. Um and then, as you say, sort of like, you know, Tim Miller came out and then you sort of you have um, James Cameron coming out saying, oh, this is the true successor. And I'm thinking, I've heard that before. Yep. Means nothing. You know, right. not going to be yep. sort of like jumping up for that one. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I don't, they say he started throwing out bits and pieces and there was sort of news about sort of Edward Furlong had been seen on set and then this yeah. had happened. And then, um, you know, there was these other bits and pieces coming out and... Uh, I, I I couldn't get a beat on what the film was gonna be, mm-hmm. um. So I, I struggled to get excited for it just because, like you know, I mean, even going in as I walked into the cinema to see it, I was very much like I'm either gonna really enjoy this mm-hmm. or it's gonna f- like land flat. Yep. And that, that that was sort of like how I felt. It was either gonna be one thing or the other. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, it, it was an odd one. I, you know, we'll get into it when we get into the story, but. It's, it's, there's, there hasn't been that many films where I've been this sort of confused going in. Like you know what I mean? Like usually you get sort of a bit of a bit of the marketing, you get a tone, yeah. you get a feel for it, and you're like, okay, I'm going to enjoy this or I'm going to hate it and I'll miss it. This I just couldn't, I couldn't get a read on it at all. I, I mean, it's almost like Scott that this movie had 
three screenwriters and seven story developers, you know, <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. which which is basically what it was. I'm probably off of the numbers, but if you look at the opening credits, uh, Goyer's in there, Cameron's involved somehow. There's a there's a lot of people with their fingers in the pot, adding something, taking stuff away. And I imagine not having kind of a clear vision, more like the first couple, it was pretty much Jim Cameron and, and William Wisher, you know what I mean? Mm. And, and it was really kind of like a very tight, simple story kind of a self-contained and now i mean it's the ip is so big been around for so long you get everybody and their brother wants a piece of this you know yeah and that was the thing again like see, even before it came out there was the announcement again of like oh we see this as the beginning of a new trilogy and it, again straight away i'm just like my shoulders slump at that it's like oh all right yeah so there's going to be you know um there's going to be story threads that they intend to pick up in later films. There's going to be this, there's going to be that. So that And that was what I was sort of worried about. If they'd have just said, oh, no, this is just a kick-ass film, you know, it'll it'll have a nice, satisfying ending that we could continue if we wanted, all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Like, yep. fine. Um, and, yeah, so I don't know. But I think, I think we'll get into it. Let, let's, let's get into it then, shall we? So... You know, this is, this is Terminator Dark Fate. Came out this year, 2019. It stars Linda Hamilton, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Mackenzie Davis, uh, Natalia Reyes, and Gabriel Luna. Mm-hmm. Um, directed by Tim Miller. As you said, script by uh, David S. Goya, James Cameron. Um, and there's other people in there as well. Uh, Josh, um, Josh Freeman, sorry. Justin Rose has been involved. Uh, Billy Ray, James Cameron, da da da. There's all these people that seem to have had a, a, a hand in it at some point, even in the editing room. So yes. James Cameron was involved in the script, then came back for editing. Yep. There was arguments apparently over it. Mm-hmm. But the story is, <laughs> the story is, and we'll get to that. So the story is a young girl, um, a young girl named Danny Ramos uh, in Mexico City, or no, is it? I can't remember it was now, but in Mexico, yep. uh, has been living life. Her and her brother work in a... A car factory, and then one day, um, her and her brother are, are attacked by the Rev Nine, uh, played by Gabriel Luna, and protected by Grace, mm-hmm. a soldier from the future, played by, played by Mackenzie Davis. Whilst on the run from the machine, um, they are they are further protected, uh, and the rather the chase is interceded by the arrival of Sarah Connor. Um, the chase continues. This film's pretty much a chase. The chase continues, yep. uh, and following further information, we find out that Sarah Connor has been receiving texts from an unknown number mm-hmm. telling her to go to different coordinates throughout the years to kill Terminators the moment they arrive through time. Uh, we later find out that those texts are coming from a T-800, played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, who and this is the thing I was the spoilers seriously spoilers people if you haven't seen it if you want to see it who following t- the events of Terminator Two Judgment Day killed John Connor in a bar uh, when he was enjoying I don't know probably like a Smirnoff Ice something like that uh, <laughs> and has since has regret and remorse for that decision uh, and has settled down with a wife and child and started a drapery business. Um, they, he leaves all that behind to con- continue the pursuit, and they eventually they go on, on a plane. There's a plane chase. They end up in a, end up in a dam, uh, where the fight continues, and he sacrifices himself to kill the Rev Nine, uh, as does Grace. And at the end, Sarah Connor and Danny Ramos walk off into the sunset to become the saviors of the future. And we'll get into the details as we go. But there's quite a lot of details in the in the film. Not a lot of plot. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Good point. Um, so because I, I didn't even mention the fact that there is no more, there's no longer a Skynet that's mm-hmm. now been replaced. The future has changed, mm-hmm. um, and they address something that we talked about uh, and I mentioned early on of of Sarah Connor being the baby maker. Mm-hmm. Uh, like they address address it directly. So that was interesting. Mm-hmm. So I saw your reaction then when I mentioned. The first, the opening scene of this film, like yep. you know, you get, you actually get some video footage from T two. You get mm-hmm. that psychiatric v- footage, yep. and then it jumps to Sarah Connor in a bar. But, oh, before we say anything about what actually happens, I will say the youth, uh, euthanization, the, the youthing, the CGI of the young Sarah Connor and the young Ed Furlong. Uh, yes. Um, uh, what's it, Connor? 
It is awesome. Yep. So impressive. Um, less so the Arnie, but mm-hmm. I think that's more because his body double. But um, yeah, that opening scene. What are your thoughts? The and I'll address the CGI, the special effects part of that scene mm. first. That almost makes the uh, the actions of that sequence harder to swallow for myself mm. and maybe other fans as well. It felt so close to how they looked back then uh, mm. that what transpired was was really uh, a gut punch. Uh, it was really tough to watch um, for me. And, and and so so we are going spoilerific, right? We're, we're going... Oh, we're, full we're on, doing full it, right? on spoilers. Warning you now, we are getting in. Full All right. on spoilers. All right. So it... So in this sequence, John gets killed by a T-800. And mm-hmm. it's, uh, at least in, in my theater, you kind of heard like a, a noticeable gasp amongst mm. the, the moviegoers. And um, this is a few days in after it was released, you know, and I saw it in IMAX. I really wanted the full experience. I wanted to give this movie a, a full chance, like, you know, mm-hmm. no preconceived notions going in. And I just wanted to say that to the listeners is that I didn't want to be this uh crotchety curmudgeon holding on to older films mm. uh and and the premises just to, w- without it moving forward you know i understand that movies need to move forward and evolve and change and i just think the way it was done how it was handled as early it was as it was in the film was a huge uh, misfire uh uh and no pun intended really i mean it's it, it's <laughs> it, it's a real it's a rough scene to watch i'm sure that was the 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 point to to really shake the viewer and go, hey, this is a new status quo. John is gone. He's the it's he's out of the picture, and I understand why they do that in in some ways because they wanted to move this story beyond his storyline. I get it. Yeah, uh, you know, and a lot of people say it was never John Connor's story to begin with. So, so John Connor getting killed in the way he does is was it was a real. I think a tough thing for a lot of the, the cinema goers mm. in, in my in my uh, film uh, when I went to the theater, I, I, there are some fans that, that I think are are totally fine with it. Um, I don't know if they're newer fans or if they're just a little more receptive to, to the new storyline. But uh, I had a problem with, it, with with how it was done mm. and why it was done, and uh, it just it, it unfortunately for me as a fan, as a longtime fan, it it kind of sours. The, the rest of the film there's there there's a, a dark cloud really um, over the rest of the film that makes me hard it makes it hard for me to connect to the 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 characters that are, they're bringing forth yeah. and it has nothing to do with the fact that they they are female characters or that they're, they're they're strong characters and they're capable it has literally nothing to do with that you know so I have I take issue also with Tim Miller putting that out as early as he did because it's almost like if you come out of this film disappointed or frustrated or angry some of my friends are angry at this movie um that we are bad people it's the ghostbusters we... 2016 effect isn't it right it's, it's that thing of like yep. well, if you're disappointed with this film it's because you hate the female reboot version and i yep. felt the same thing, you know and i have a similar reaction to this film as i did the Ghostbusters 2016, funny enough. Like, I enjoyed that film. Right. Uh, and I enjoyed a lot of this film. But, mm-hmm. again, it's like you say, it's not the event. I could have been quite happy with the death yeah. of John Connor. Like, mm-hmm. it's not... This is a film about time travel. Like, they have continued to explain right. that the future is not... As you just, as, as we've said before, like, there's, there, there's no fate. Like, there is no fate for what you make. So, right. they've explained yeah. that the future is malleable. It can change. Mm-hmm. But at least make his death meaningful. Right. To be taken out like a punk is mm-hmm. is um, you know horrific, tragic. Like it's it's. I kind of like there's parts of the, the one thing I like is that following the events of T two, like you know they obviously get away, mm-hmm. they go to a beach. I like the opening scene actually. There's a moment in the opening scene where you still see the 1997 or the, it's set in 1998 so it's set about a year to 18 months after the events of T2 mm-hmm. or you know in in yep. timeline but you see what could have mm-hmm. been and you see the beach is full of skulls and you see the T800 skeletons working up onto the beach yeah and they're right. about to shoot right, right. surviving little girl and it flashes like boom like that's the timeline changing and it goes to the holiday resort and I'm like that's cool like that's a great idea mm-hmm. I love that moment I was like oh, okay this is interesting Right. And then to see Sarah Connor sitting on a beach enjoying enjoying a drink. Again, mm. I'm like, okay. It doesn't really feel 
in character for someone who's been obsessing what? for 10 years about the end of the world. Well, plus she, she had her back to a public uh, place. To base, what someone online said that too, they said the least realistic part of that sequence was that Sarah had her back to the opening of, of that uh, little bar, a cantina. You know? mm. and, and if we know anything about her character, she she would always be, on, even years after Judgment Day is over, she would still, there'd be parts of her that would still not let yeah, her guard she, down. She you know? has got She'd be watching out for her yeah, son. She has got, she's highly trained, highly paranoid. But the fact of the matter is, like, her paranoia is real. Like that's You don't just fix that mm-hmm. overnight. Um, Correct. And so yep. it felt a little bit, you know, like, oh, she let a guard down, and then, yep. you know, you have the, the, the T-800 walk up on them. Um, mm-hmm. And, yeah, it, it just, <laughs> I don't know, it just felt, to be taken out like a punk is, like, at this scene, like, literally this T-800 walks up and shoots him and walks off. Right. You know, and she she attacks it, and, you know, it's quite cool. He grabs her by the hair and flips her over, and I, I quite like some of that. But, mm-hmm. yeah. It, it, there's there's just a, there's a lot for fans to be brought along for this ride. So it, it's almost like, uh, in some ways, this movie is a little bit like Reese in the first movie, and the fans are kind of like Sarah in the first movie, mm. because the movie is taking taking us long for this ride, whether we want it or not, mm. because uh, I like I, I think some fans are really uh, are receptive to this new concept. I mean, when I say new, I mean, John Connor has been killed in the timeline many mm. times throughout the series, like kind of like in the alternate timelines meaning the sequels so i was doing a little thinking about it so if you follow terminator 3 rise of the machines in the future term uh, 2032 i think the year is stated john connor is dead yeah. uh and, and kate brewster sends back the machine to protect them. yes so we do know that he dies in that timeline yeah, yeah. okay let's go to the, let's go to the next one terminator 4 salvation terminator salvation john connor doesn't die but he very nearly dies with a, a huge spike through his chest yeah uh very nearly dies but it's close Terminator 5, they happen to be a villain. He's a heel, yeah. and he dies at the end uh, as a villain. Okay, And then I was recently watching the Sarah Connor Chronicles. I try to say that mm. right. Uh, Sarah Connor Chronicles. Um, in the pilot episode of that TV program, it uh, takes place a few years after T2 is over, and there's an opening dream sequence where John Connor gets murdered by a Terminator. Mm. And Sarah grabs him. She says, do it. She says, there's nothing left to live for kind of thing. And even that brief little scene of the pilot episode, I thought was better handled than this film. Yeah. Uh, just the way it was done. And unfortunately, and I know we haven't even touched upon the main story yet of this film, but it's it, it's hurtful, I think, to some of the earlier movies, T1 and T2 especially, because you have, it changes sort of, the mission Mm -hmm. or changes sort of the 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 concept and let let me elaborate real quick so john is killed at the start of this film so because he dies um a a new person takes over as like world leader against this new artificial Mm -hmm. intelligence which is um danny right uh the the young girl danny now to me and maybe you see this differently or the same way but that shows to me that the mission to protect John Connor is pointless. Yeah. In T1 and T2. The only thing that mattered was the destruction of Cyberdyne systems. Mm-hmm. So why didn't, I mean, it, like if I'm going to really kind of geek out about it, kind of get into the nitty gritty, there's no reason for John to have been protected at all. No. Yeah. Because his murder meant nothing. And his, and even Sarah Connor's survival meant nothing. Mm. Because as long as you had someone to go back and blow up Cyberdyne systems, to stop Skynet from being developed, or maybe someone to just kill Miles Dyson, yeah. and that's it. Yeah. Then the series over. So it, it makes you it wonder why they didn't do the that. John Sarah equation in many ways. completely off the table, and, you know, and and for that I hate it. it I hate yeah. it. Yeah, it makes me wonder now why they sort of like you go back to um, some of those comics that have done similar things. But, but yes, but you're right. Like now you think back, if you were one of those Resistance fighters, if you were John Connor, actually. In the future, mm-hmm. and you know, obviously, you know, predetermined, whatever. But if you're John Connor in the future, why not? You know the events. Why not just send a band of resistance fighters back to kill uh, Miles Dyson? Like, it opens up these questions. Mm-hmm. If that's all that matters, then I don't know. I mean, you get into the whole timey wimey, wibbly wobbly timey wimey thing. But right, right. And, and this is a series that has always had. 
uh, plot holes and issues mm-hmm. even from moment one. Because, uh, you know, it, and, and as fans, we've kind of just been like, hey, what do you, they shrug our shoulders. We say, hey, it's it's Terminator. You know what I yeah. mean? It's it, w- There's some things we're going to have to snigger about and kind of laugh and go, ah, it's okay. You know, it is what it is. doesn't make a ton yeah. of sense. You know, yeah, why, you know, why is there only one always sent back? Why did, all, all these kind of things. Why is there... You know, how can the T-1000 go back in time? Mm. Because it has a liquid metal, yeah. all these kind of goofy things that we kind of break down and we rationalize. We're like, wow. You know, and we, but but it comes to a point where uh, this part of the story, and, and I heard that maybe even this was Jim Cameron's idea, perhaps. I don't know. I wasn't in the room. That, but unfortunately, it, it, yeah. it go That's ahead. That's what yeah. I've heard. I've heard the same thing. And But again, like it tells me that they came to this thing with with an intention of like say shaking things up and again i respect that yeah. i don't mind him yeah. dying that's not a problem mm-hmm. but yeah. you could have done this so differently of having like just mm-hmm. avoid all that front bit right and have it have right. it that it's sarah and john in that position that have been mm-hmm. receiving this i mean i don't know how you receive the text or there'll be some way of doing it they're receiving right. messages from, from about it they intercede and he the rev nine kills him like the, you know and then, mm-hmm. then they're like, then she's like, oh my god, and you know, right. and then they, if they did, then did that, if they killed John, the Rev Nine killed John Connor, and then had the reveal that Grace had mm-hmm. no idea who he was, right? That would be a more important gut punch because then you know, because you got Sarah mm-hmm. going like, the you know, the uh, leader of the resistance has been killed, and Grace is like, who? Right. You know, that's when you go, well, wait a minute. And she's like, oh, yeah, the future changed. Like, this was always, de- this this event was destined to happen. Actually, there's a difference, you know, yeah. saviour. That would have been a better way of doing it. For my... It, it, the story li- the story had potential. I mean, that part of the story had potential mm-hmm. because, you know, not seeing him... Okay, so we're, we're diehard fans. Mm-hmm. We maybe have seen some of the ads and the promotional materials and his character wasn't anywhere in any of that stuff they had no announcements other than what you said scott is that uh eddie furlong was seen on set or maybe was involved briefly and that doesn't bode well for fans of his character mm. now we, we've obviously complained about his character a lot in recent movies you yeah. know from christian bale's portrayal where he's just a jerk and <laughs> just yells at everybody but but now you now you're kind of going back and this is the other thing that pisses me off too is that my understanding is this is that john connor's role in the future, is important regardless of what happens. Yes. If the bombs drop or not, his his role in the future is a leader. Yes. Okay? And they're taking that right off the table. So if the bombs don't drop, if he doesn't become the worldwide leader of the military resistance, he is said to lead in, in civic duty mm-hmm. and helping uh, to uh, mend bridges across society via uh, politics or whatever, yeah. you know? And, and so he just... He's irrelevant. He's, you know, because there are a lot of people online saying, "Who gives a crap?" John Connor was going to be a a whiny git anyway. He was just going to be a jerk. You know, he, look what a brat he was in the movie. He's just going to be a little jerk asshole. And honestly, is it, seeing how he wasn't T two, that's a believable thing. But, but by the end of the movie, he is at least in Terminator two. I'm referring to. Mm. He's kind of accepted more of a of a more mature. Yeah. Uh, well, that's his story, I think, yeah. too, isn't it? That acceptance of his role, and it mm-hmm. grows throughout that film from the moment he's telling, you know, he's telling the T eight hundred not to kill people, to, right. um, you know, willing to sacrifice things, and then at the end of it, that sort of the, you know, the, the emotional departure at the end. It's all part of his growth. So if people aren't getting, that, but now it doesn't matter though. But but now it doesn't matter, yeah. right? Because he's taken his piece is taken off the board, and so we can go for. The, you can look at these new characters now i i sort of think that maybe i'm just harping on it too much but there must i wish there was some way that we could introduce the new characters without i feel like really disrespecting the legacy characters oh, the, you know what i mean yeah. and that's does yeah this is and this is the thing that's her thing I, I was thinking about this and it's because it's happening more and more isn't it? Like this is this is the force awakens of um yes the terminators franchise you yep. know what i mean so yep. and i feel that like the, I feel that The Force Awakens did it better and showed more respect mm-hmm. than this film did. Like that film, mm-hmm. sort of like you know, it has um, Easter mm-hmm. eggs in it and musical cues. It treats characters right. I mean, people were pissed off with Han Han Solo's death, spoilers with Han Solo's death in uh, Force Awakens. Right, but that death mm-hmm. has more emotion and plot reasoning and everything than than anywhere close to John Connor's death in this. I, I agree with you 100%, Scott. I agree 100%. Yep. 
So, but, yeah. but let's let's move let's move past that because we could be arguing about this for a while. Um, but the I fact know, of the matter yeah. is, it, it th- 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 that happens, and then it jumps forward to present day. It jumps forward to, t- to 2019, and we get to Danny and her brother um, working in a a a car factory, uh, and then we also get the arrival of Grace and the Rev Nine. So. This is where it sort of kicks off. This is where we jump into sort of like, you know, oh, now the news, we've sort of like, it's almost like you say, we've cleaned the table, now let's get to the new story. Um, right. So what what are your thoughts on sort of like the new setup and the, the sort of the introduction of these characters? Well, it, you know, I, myself, I was still numb from the events of the earlier part mm. of the film, you know, and so, and I'm just kind of like, my mind's racing, being a science fiction fan, I'm thinking, okay, is that, did that really happen? Yeah. Did they really do what they what I think they did, you know, because, and I'm also feeling the hurt as a longtime fan as well. And just thinking about all the films, but so I'm just like, okay, well, I guess I just have to think about what's the, what's going on in the present. Uh, and, and how it was going down was, was actually not too bad. This is where I kind of wish the movie sort of started. And if they were going to have John Connor get murdered as a 12 year old kid, um, I wish they kind of, maybe they could have teased it, but they kind of, I wish they kind of showed it later on mm. when we, we're fully invested in the new characters um, because having him die so early really shakes the storyline too much for fans. I think, you know, Do you know what? That's another good point. That would have been even better. Wouldn't it? Like introduce Sarah on her own. So you're constantly asking like, where's John? Where's John? Right. And then, she, then they're sort of like, who, who are you? And why are you so bitter and angry? And then she, if she was to mm-hmm. relay the events, then I think, yeah, that that actually would have been worked better, wouldn't it? To have it slotted in later in the film as a reveal. Well, that's what I was I was thinking. I mean, I'm not a screenwriter like like, like uh, the 17 people who worked in this movie, but um, you know, it, and it's just and it's a very simple movie. It's a, it's a simple storyline. Mm-hmm. It's it kind of goes back to bare bones in in some ways, which is uh, it's a chase must protect the the new important person. Mm-hmm. That that that's it, you know. And in some ways, it exceeds, it excels in that. Is what I should say. You know that um, the it's it's almost like we know the premise. We know there's going to be two opposing figures meeting at this access point. This uh, you know this person who needs to be protected, and how's that going to play out? And yeah. seeing um, Mackenzie Davis as Grace come in and uh, wail on the Rev Nine was was actually a very a cool scene. You know, we we see her doing all sorts of uh, acrobatic moves and fighting him. And it makes me wonder why, you know, it took so darn long to, to get kind of an, an enhanced human to take on these machines. You know what I mean? Yeah. So well, it's a good idea. It, it yeah. is. But here's, the, here's one of the things you say about being a simple film, and it is a simple plot, because it is it's a chase film. And there's some parts of in and there's something in that that's very satisfying, because the action in this film mm-hmm. is very competent and in very many cases like very satisfying. Mm-hmm. However, some of the story or some of the character arcs are less so. Some of them are very good. Right. Like I actually really like Danny's story arc. I think her stepping yep. up, you know, yep. and, and realization is actually quite cool. Um, mm-hmm. But the thing with Grace is, like, you know, or it's not explored, is there's clearly a step in in the future where the way to defeat mm-hmm. these robots, you know, these androids, or you know, the the T what eight. Or the Rev Nines, whatever they are, Legion is the new AI, is to enhance yep. the human body. So she keeps saying, like, I oh, know I'm human, but I have cybernetic mm-hmm. enhancements. And so there's this sort of like, it's never really addressed, and maybe it would have been done in a future sequel that's clearly never going to happen. But, but yeah. this notion of like, well, what, how, do you, how do you have to reconcile the fact that you have robotics and a power source, we'll get mm-hmm. to that in your own body in order to defeat what you're getting yeah. a step closer towards. Like you're having to rely on the robotic right. technology that clearly you're fighting mm-hmm. against. There's none of that. Mm-hmm. It's just sort of accepted that she's enhanced human. I think that's sort of an over, I think that's a, a fallout of superhero films. Mm. Yeah. Um, but really that should be, if, if this was just a James Cameron film, I feel that would be a mm-hmm. story point. Her having to explain and, and come to terms with the idea yeah. of, or someone would say it like, well, "You're no better than a machine." Yeah, right. Um, I don't know. It just it just felt like a missing link or a missing piece in this puzzle at times. I was like, "Oh, you you've just seemed to accept this and you're just carrying on." And the fact that you need medication because your body mm-hmm. is clearly rejecting these things, like no one's going right. to talk about that. That's not going to be a theme. Like, <laughs> 
And that's frustrating, too, as a viewer, because I think some of the juicier part to the story for some of the fans is that it was glossed over for parts that some parts just didn't work. Mm. You know what I mean? So that that that's frustrating that there were there are things in here that are interesting. Mm. So I'm, I'm, I'm not hating on it completely. You know, that there are things that are fascinating. Um you know, what does that do to some like like a Sarah Connor's kind of psyche? What does it do to somebody to to live with the knowledge of the future and now losing her son? So there are things that are glossed over completely mm. in favor of thing other things that might not work as well, just for more action sequences. And and that and that's a shame. Um, I, I I didn't have as much of a problem with Grace is because she showed her vulnerability pretty quick. Is that she she showed that she's not one hundred percent perfect at all times. Is that she needed to recover. And I think that was that's an important thing for a character moment because in a lot of these movies uh, nowadays, it's like you have these characters that are perfect that are they have no problem yeah. learning the skills that that legacy characters took m- entire franchise yeah. developing and they're perfect from minute one. I I like Grace that is badass and she's throwing all the rebars at the Rev Nine and all that kind of stuff like that. That stuff was great. That opening sequence was I've heard someone online say. That chase with the on the freeway mm. was like a third a third act chase in the first act of the movie. Yeah, I, I you know, agree. Which is, I agree with that. Like, which is adrenaline awesome problem. and also weird. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So so, but the fact that she showed a little like a a, side, a more human side, you know, I'm not trying to say that oh we need our female heroes to be flawed. No, we we need all heroes to be flawed because that's why they're yeah. heroes. You know, so that that's that's what I keep pushing back against. You know what I'm saying? No, I had no problem with, with staff. I, I know. I totally agree. And uh, the thing is, I think Mackenzie Davis is actually really good in this film. Like, I yeah, think she, she I agree. does carry like a real emotion to this film. And there's so much more that sort of like, as you learn about clearly her relationship to that older Danny, um, during the mm-hmm. war years, like it's never explicit. Nothing is explicitly said, but there's clearly a connection there. Mm-hmm. And, when you get the sort of like the flashback of uh, the flash forward, I suppose, of um, the future and the young Grace being saved by an old, a slightly older Danny, yeah. like you get right. it, you go, oh, okay, that's fine. But there's clearly like years after that that there's there's a relationship yeah. and there's a you know there's a respect and an admiration. So I understand why she's come back. Like this isn't like this isn't Kyle coming back because he loves Sarah. This is this mm-hmm. is a soldier right. coming back to protect her best her close friend and mentor and again like again it's something like that's really interesting never explored it's a suicide mission really you know yeah she is sacrificing herself for her friend and mentor i really think that that her character is the best part of the future element of this film because Mm. uh learning about legion and learning about the rev nine uh model machine and i believe that the other ones were called rev sevens Mm -hmm. or whatever those are the where I, I think honestly that's the most underdeveloped part of the movie mm. because we can't really connect to the true antagonist of the story, which is Legion, right? And, and so, yes, the the Rev Nine is the present, the clear and present danger, right? But yeah. but Skynet was always in all the movies, in all the shows, in all the video games, and all the books uh, has always been the the secret. Um, ultimate villain the, the emperor palpatine that's exactly will, what i was going to say you know? the terminator are always like the darth vader aren't they and then the emperor's always yes, sat in the yeah. background i was un- i'm still slightly undecided about something that this film does um uh, with regards to legion so you know she, mm-hmm. grace explains it at some point that yeah i have no idea I'd never heard of skynet don't know what it is I'm taking that off the table again mm-hmm. i understand why it makes total sense but there's yeah. a, but you know oh so our, our ai in the future is called legion and you go, all right, cool. I'm happy mm-hmm. with that. Not a problem. And Sarah Connor's response, actually, I quite like. She's like, yeah, there's always. She's so resigned to it at this point. She's so sort of like she's obviously been killing mm-hmm. Terminators on and off for like thirty years that she's a bit like, mm-hmm. yeah, all right. <laughs> it was bound to happen. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That. But the, the the interesting thing is, like, you see that I think the future happens. The future you see is forty uh, twenty forty two. Yep. Um. But they never give us a date of when um, they never give us a date of when Legion, you know, takes over. There's no, there's no Kyle Reese story. You know, Kyle Reese sort of says that whole uh, they get the whole story of like you know on this date this happens and then nineteen the third you know was it twenty ninth of August nineteen ninety seven mm-hmm. the nuclear yep. weapons were fired. You don't get that with Legion. Like you have no idea mm-hmm. between twenty nineteen and twenty forty two something happens. <laughs> 
<laughs> and they do give you a date. Like they show you it happening. Like they show you young Grace. And yeah. this is where I start to get a little. I'm like really confused because they sort of Grace mm-hmm. gives you this thing of like when I was a kid this happened. And you go right, okay, so it's going to happen at some point in the future. 2042. So that's mm-hmm. 20 what 23 years from now. Right, okay. How old Grace? But then at the end of the film, they see a girl that is credited in the in the credits as 10-year-old mm-hmm. Grace. Mm-hmm. And then you've obviously seen her in her teens, I'd say later teens, probably sort of 16, 17 maybe, being saved by Danny. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, what, we're how many years away from Legion? Like It's never stated, but it's... It, it feels like an in, mm-hmm. in, an imminent threat, but without ever ever mm-hmm. being explained. <laughs> right, and, and there's a lot that's not explained because I I was doing a little research about this, mm. and the so the movie had come out, and Tim Miller sat down with a news site or whatever, and they asked him all these nagging questions uh, that the diehard fans are like, "What about this? Mm. What about that?" You know, and some of some of it is pretty picky, right? Let's let's face it, you know, fans can like ourselves can be pretty mm. picky, right? You know, sometimes we're never happy. You know, we want one thing, they do it and then we're still angry. Um, but they, the one thing that I got from this article was that he kept on saying, well, you know, we, we, we were going to address it, but we're thinking of addressing it in a future film. And all these moments that could really have enriched the story, despite some of the um, disrespect that they did to some of the characters early on, we could have really invested in this story and that if they just add a little bit of meat to the, to the bone, learn about Legion, learn about mm-hmm. why they made the same exact damn mistakes as Skynet, you know, why they call their machines Terminators as well, all this kind of, you know, stuff like that. We can really kind of grab onto it, but there's all these questions they kept asking him and he's like, well, yeah, oh well. And <laughs> that's show, that's just a big misstep, whether it's editorial, writing, directing, whatever, there's something that went wrong that all these fans are going, well, what about this? Well, well, well how was Arnie getting the coordinates? Oh, like All these questions, like, well, we'll address it some other time. Well, and they won't. They won't no, I mean, no, they'll you know? never get the opportunity to. And this is the thing, like I say, I, I, I'm in two minds about it, because I love the fact that when you, when you get the date um, of Judgment Day, you know, when mm-hmm. you're watching this four film in sort of, um, you know, nineteen eighty four, and you get nineteen ninety seven as your judgment day, right. you're like, oh my god, that's, you know, twelve to thirteen years away from now. That's crazy. Like, right. You know, that that's an imminent time clock. That's a that's a ticking clock. I mean, granted, it's, it's over a decade away, but for, from Sarah Connor's point of view, as she's driving off into the mm-hmm. sunset of Terminator at the end of Terminator, it's a right. ticking clock. Like you know, the storm that mm-hmm. is coming, both metaphorically and obviously physically, like it's as you said, Skynet. It's this, it's this imminent threat. So you've got that. It's an, it's an, it's an evident imminent threat. This film sort of flips it by not giving them anything. So when, when at the end of the film, Sarah and Danny sort of ride off into the sunset, they have no knowledge. And to me, I was like, that's actually slightly scarier. All you know mm-hmm. is something is coming. Like this legion is going to be right. created, and now you've got to do your own detective work to try and stop yep. it and prepare for it. And that felt a little bit more. That felt more of a threat. Like that felt more suspenseful, but also less satisfying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And, and allegedly, they're they're if if they were to make more movies, that they were. There was just a, a humongous amount of other Terminators out there, just waiting in the wings, waiting to to defeat, um, you know, Sarah and and Danny, and and now at least as of right now, they have no um, superhuman esque protector mm. to help them. They're just they're just two human beings, and one of them being a. Uh, an older lady, uh, battle hardened, no doubt. But so it's like, it, it kind of changes the whole dynamic a bit. You know mm. what I mean? And you remember how, we, how we joked about how Genesis ended in the last one. It was like, they were all live. They were all together. They were driving yeah. off and they were going to like go party and yeah. go to the theme park. They were just, <laughs> it's just like, you, you know, this is one of those things where it's just like, there's, there's so many unanswered questions. I think it's, it's, it's tough for the viewers to in- invest in it, but there are some fans who really, really like this one. But so I mean, maybe I'm just missing something. Well, no, so. I'll, I'll be honest with you. So if you, if when I when I watch this, so you talk about that opening, uh, the car chase, and it mm-hmm. goes, it goes on, and it ends with sort of Sarah Connor's introduction, 
and then it goes on and it just you know then they go off and, and then there's another bit and it just keeps going like this yeah. the, the, the pace of this film is is non-stop like it stops right. for little breaths mm-hmm. like <laughs> exposition yeah. and off we go and that's it like you know and there's little moments mm-hmm. like that that are fine um but i really enjoyed the pace of this film like, i enjoyed the fact that mm-hmm. it's non-stop um mm-hmm. and it's sort of like that opening chase. It grabbed me. Like the moment, this sort of the Rev Nine appears in. In fact, I take. Let's talk about. Let's talk about Gabriel Luna as the Rev Nine. Yes. Yep. I really liked him. I felt. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you made this good, but I actually liked him. I felt like he was a step up from a T One Thousand. In character. So the moment he answers the door, and he's, he's like, "I'm, at, I'm, at, I'm looking for Danielle Ramos," and she's like, "You know, who are you? Mm-hmm. I'm one of his, one of her friends." And it's like, mm-hmm. "Oh, her friends call her Danny." And he's like, "Right." And you just think, oh, you, you're, you're mm. fucked. <laughs> you is done for. Yeah, yeah. He has right. he has a sort of a personality because he said it's weird, but like I'm like I'm not going to associate him with the T1000 or the T800. This is a different future. Um, so yep. even later on, when he sort of um, he goes to the uh, border patrol thing, and uh, mm-hmm. the guy says to him about, oh, he says, oh, you know, um, he hands over his weapon and stuff, and he, he makes a joke and says, whole body's a weapon. And you're just thinking. Wow, these things crack a joke now. Like they're they're sort of like just for their own amusement. This is weird and creepy. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just found him really entertaining. Like I quite enjoyed him as the as the Rev Nine. Terrible name, yeah. but good, same here. Good, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember you said that last episode too. You're like Rev Nine's the the Rev Nine's the worst name in in history. Yeah. You know, it sounds like a co- a cosmetic product or something. You know, so. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it's it, and you know it's funny you said that because a lot of people haven't discussed Gabriel Luna's performance in this movie, even though he, along with the rest of the cast, put in a lot of hours at the gym, mm. a lot of probably training with like mime coaches most likely, and just really getting into that mindset of being able to split his uh, being into uh, an endoskeleton, uh, which I thought was a very cool mm. looking endoskeleton. And uh, and this uh, this liquid metal uh, person, you know what I mean? That could, that's but together they're stronger. I kind of like that idea. Mm. That they they are a stronger unit. That's why they keep on coming back together. But they're equally as deadly separate, mm. you know. And of of course, if this movie series were to continue, I'm trying to scratch my head at what kind of more advanced machines they could keep sending back. Yeah. Uh, how much sillier it's going to get, you know what I mean? So, um, but I thought he did a great job, and overall, he was a pretty intimidating character. You talked about the action. He, he it was nonstop you know he was always a threat he was always chasing them down always using the modern technology to mm. uh, find ways to them which was uh, an interesting way of showing how a movie like Terminator 1 would have played in today's audience mm. you know what they would have done you know uh, and that's terrifying the fact that he can just hack into any network and just go okay yep okay because there's cameras everywhere you know so I thought he did a great job yeah yep. I really enjoyed him in this and, I th- and again I thought I liked the Terminator design um there's a few people that, like, say, really nitpicky. They're like, "Well, how does it work?" And do this. And I'm like, "How did the first one work? It's nonsense. Just don't worry about that." Like, <laughs> um, right. It's. It, I like it. I like the fact that there's parts of the skeleton that clearly are storage mm-hmm. for the rest of the the liquids. The the mm-hmm. the, the chest cavity and the head cavity look hollow because that's where the liquid metal sits. Yeah. Like, that's like a really cool design. So I really like all that. I thought mm-hmm. he was amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, he feels like a threat. Like he feels like in this, he, he, it feels closer to the T one thousand sort of stalking them in in T two. Um, mm-hmm. What I would say is though about this whole film, and this, we've talked about the car chase, is yeah, is this thing of escalation? And when you say that, those people have said that's the third act chase in the first act. It's amazing and it really is cool, but then you do go, what are they going to do next? Yeah, and it all goes a little bit fast and furious towards the end. <laughs> um, if if yep. you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Um. So it's true. Yeah, it's it, it. It's fine. It's good. It's, it goes on. I find the cast are all pretty good. It's it's when. But what are your th- so you know the film sort of splits into two for my thinking. Yep. Because yep. there's pre Arnie and there's post Arnie. Yep. So let's just say, what are your thoughts on the pre Arnie half of the film? What would you know if that was if Arnie had never introduced and they'd continued on that sort of trajectory? Um, right. What would be would, you know? What are your thoughts? Well, you know, it, it, it's a tough thing because you know I, I was saying 
what what could happen if they had wrote it differently if they had uh, even if they didn't have Linda Hamilton and Arnie coming back for this one fans would have complained it was possibly too similar to the earlier mm-hmm. uh, plot outlines of okay you have one protector you have one VIP and you have a machine and even though that's a lean uh, mean movie uh, and it makes you know like the like Terminator 1 for example you know it's it's too derivative of, of those earlier movies so I understand why they they added other components like the like Sarah Connor coming back mm-hmm. so I would even argue to say this movie is a pre Sarah Connor post Sarah Connor movie so mm-hmm. as opposed to when we get to Arnie because this is one of those things where I think I would have appreciated seeing Sarah and then Arnie later on more if they weren't plastered all over every poster yeah. and they weren't in every advertisement and we didn't see that bridge scene 30 times, yeah. you know, I'll be back. You know, all this kind of goofy stuff where, and I have the same criticism for other films like with um, Force Awakens, of course, and, and Blade Runner 2049. Mm-hmm. We mentioned that, I think, last episode. If, if I didn't know that Harrison Ford wasn't, wasn't com- was coming back, that part would have absolutely blew my mind in Blade Runner, uh, the second Blade Runner movie, because I'm a big Blade Runner fan. And the fact that he was front and center practically in all the posters, it's like, okay, now you're just waiting. Yeah. You're just waiting. How are they going to do it? You're reverse engineering in your mind. How are they going to get to Harrison Ford? And I had the same problem with this one. If I didn't know Sarah and Arnie were coming back, it would have probably blew my mind. And that's another reason why I said if they removed the um, opening John getting shot to death scene and moved it to a later part of the film if they had to do it move it later i would appreciate it more because i was like holy crap you know this is this just got real sarah freaking connor is back like, yeah. i would have been much more jazzed about it right but yeah but, yeah we're gonna say no that? i was gonna say yeah. i i i actually agree that i actually think some of these films just benefit from never looking at the marketing <laughs> i mean you can't avoid yeah. it like it's all over posters on buses and you know on every bloody uh it's all it's just all over the place like you say it was it was you couldn't avoid it um but yeah, yeah you're right like, yep, it would have been a, a real fist pumping i mean it's designed to be a fist pumping moment like her stepping up she gets the hero shot like you know she steps out the car and it pans up her and she's like you're like oh my god like sarah connor's back like that's amazing right yeah but you're also like, and, and if yeah, no, but, ahead, yeah. but you're also like oh, okay so, okay so she's now you know so 15 minutes in you're like oh, okay cool she's arrived now and that's it <laughs> Yeah, and that's a good point. And, and you know, if I and that's why I avoid all the commercials mm. and all the trailers as much as possible. People are like, "Dude, did you see the new Star Wars trailer?" Mm. I'm like, "No, I'm trying to avoid it because I really want to like be as uh, as open to it as as I can yeah. when I go to see it." And you just you just can't. You just can't. And of course, if they if I hadn't known Linda Hamilton's coming back for this one, uh, and she had just popped out of the Jeep, I see her blast and I'm fist pumping just like you're saying. But then another thought in the back of my mind where's john yeah exactly is what's right where is he why isn't he there as an adult to help like i would have wanted to see him kind of as an adult as a protector mm. kind of like being like listen when i was like instead of killing him off could, was there any other way to include him in the story without uh getting rid of him and without crapping on the new characters you could have him be like listen when i was a kid these things were after me you, you, you can even have sarah back as little old lady sarah she could have been back as well but maybe john could have been there being like listen this is i'm here we changed the future but something's wrong yeah. danny must be one of like another resistance leader and another part of the world something there's a much I don't better know, way it's like, this because yeah. I, I like the story i actually quite like i say i like this future that's being presented i like the idea of danny being an mm-hmm. alternate um savior mm-hmm. just the way the information is dropped is so crap i mean everyone sort of goes on about david s goya and i honestly think he's not you know, you get so many jobs. He's, he's obviously made. He's written some amazing films. I won't. I can't deny it. But also, like he's written some clunkers. Like he's not this great, um, you know, uh, scriptwriter that I think people think he is. I think he gets overblown. Um, and the mm-hmm. same with like, yep. you know, with it, it now shows me that this whole thing with Tim Miller. Like, there was a clearly a, a, an issue between Brian Reynolds and Tim Miller. That's mm-hmm. why he didn't come back for Deadpool two. Right. And so you can see what in this film, you can see where Tim Miller's skills lie. Like the action mm-hmm. looks brilliant. Mm-hmm. You know, he can shoot action until the cows come home, and it'll look amazing. Like he really can sort of like capture it really well. Mm-hmm. But he has no care for character or you know yeah. plot beats. Like he wants to just I... move past them as quick as possible for the next thing to happen. I agree with you. I agree with you. Yep. Um, and that's a real shame. 
But I will say, like we've you know we've been said about Gabriel Luna, we've talked about McKen- uh, Mackenzie Davis. Going back to these original cast members, um, Sarah Connor, uh, Linda Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, despite the fact that like I I dislike the, what she's left with or that she has to start with in this film, like she's great. Mm-hmm. Like Linda Hamilton is really good in this film. Mm-hmm. Um, as a sort of like drunk, bitter, um, you know, like all she's got left is killing Terminators, like you know, and so it's just it's just the only thing she's got. It, it I feel that hollowness and that bitterness from it. I think she's really good in this. I think she she's a a really great actress. People kind of forget that mm. because she, after T two she just became the muscle. She mm. just became the physicality, and that was never what she was all about. I mean, the reason why she got to that point is because she's such a method actor. Mm. Uh, she's she's classically trained uh, in New York. You know, she's she has uh, really excellent acting uh, chops that people just forget about. And of course, she had her own struggles in life. You know, she had a lot of uh, personal issues mm. that she was dealing with. But you know, uh, and, and this this sounds horrible to say, but it's like I think having Arnie and Linda back, even though while watching it, I was excited to see them. I think the story took the greatest asset of this film and made it the biggest weakness. Mm. And what I mean by that is, so I was saying a few minutes ago is that if you just had Mackenzie Davis and Natalia Reyes, uh, the, the the two female leads, be about them. People go, well, it's just like Terminator One, mm. right? So, so what can we do? Remember, we talk about the writers in the writers' mm-hmm. room. What can we do to make it unique? Oh, let's get Linda and it's Arnie back, right? But I felt like that the way that they were able to shoehorn them back into the plot, I think at least for me, doesn't doesn't really work well because it's almost like. Oh really? Oh, okay. You know, it's like ah. Uh. So it's it's almost like trying to find a a real reason why there will be an Arnie, who's seventy three years old, yeah. who's 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 uh, has his own drapery business, and who's has who has his own dog and his own family and a platonic relationship, and it's so it's like it, it almost be it takes the premise to a a. a f- it's too far to reach for a lot of folks. Yeah. I, I think I think you know the way I see it in my head, the way I, I, I would love to have seen this be is Arnie didn't have to be. They, they've they've because Arnie's been in, in all of them, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, I love Arnie. I am a massive Arnold Schwarzenegger fan, and he. We'll get onto him in this film in a second, but mm-hmm. it's almost like you know, like you say, they're trying to sort of shoehorn in this sort of like seventy year old guy, and you're like, all right, fine, he is still in good shape for a seventy. I mean, he's better in he's, he looks better in his seventies than I do in my thirties. So you know, fair play to him. Mm-hmm. Yep. But yep. And then you sort of go, okay, but then you could have done the story, and I still think it would have been a better story where don't make Mackenzie Davis cybernetic, or at least mm-hmm. reduce her cybernetics, so she's got a little bit of mm-hmm. enhancement, but she's not Captain America. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you sort of like introduce Sarah Connor and John Connor, and have them be like mm-hmm. you know they've spent time and they've been on the resistance, they've been on the thing. Like I, there is some way of, of I don't know, I'd have to think of a way of. They find out about why they're introduced. Maybe introduce them after the car chase. Like they see reports yeah. of yep. you know this machine or something happened on the high, and they go to find out what the hell is going on. Right. And the film should end really like have the rev. Not, I still think those two turn up. Have some someone play John Connor, not Ed Furlong. You know, like you say, mm-hmm. bless him. He's got his own sort of difficulties in life. He's had to deal with some real demons. Um, mm-hmm. Get someone in to be who could be charismatic, tough, burly to play a John Connor. Like someone who has continued mm-hmm. to train just in case. Because you know what? We always knew yeah. the future's malleable. There could always be another thing. So we've always stayed right. on top of that. We've always stayed on the run sort of thing. Because let's have, a, let's have a, a, a fully grown adult John Connor that could actually be a bleeding leader, not to shout at people. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And I would like to see that. And then have him sacrifice himself to save Danny by the end of the film. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the film, right. you have Danny, Sarah, and um, Grace going off to face this uncertain mm-hmm. future. Yes, yeah. You know that's that for me is okay, and that's that is that's a handing over of the torch because that's John Connor saying, "Well, I was the savior of the resistance. I was the savior of humanity, yeah. but clearly I'm not anymore." You yes, know, Danny, go. This is for you to do now. Right. That feels neater which, which, than which, what we got. Th- th- that's a better so 
you should have been the 18th screenwriter in this, in this film <laughs> because I think that's I think that's a way way better idea because you know it, it's it, you're right you said a phrase that's really interesting Scott passing of the torch yeah. and I think the way it's done in this film and a lot of fans are totally happy with it I'm not one of them yeah, the, the torch wasn't passed it was stolen it was taken from a legacy character who we've we've known to kind of like follow and root for mm. and uh, is very iconic you know people are always wanting to learn more about John Connor and yes in the last couple of movies there's been a lot of misfires mm. there's been a lot of missteps with the character you know in Salvation he's just an angry jerk yelling mm. at everybody as we know you know things like that you know but he's still like in a leadership role now this this is something that's you kill him as a kid and you I, I just really feel like that hurts a lot of the early films I really I really do and you know and, and we always joke about how like uh, other movies other franchises right you have um, you have movies like Highlander you have movies like Halloween um, you you have these movies that are, are, are basically um, when it, when the new one comes out, they kind of replace the old one. Yeah. You know, like Highlander and Halloween, I was saying, you know. So you have, like, every time a new one comes out, it's like, you know what? Uh, let's just forget about the last couple or the last one. Mm. And it's just this, this just franchise fatigue that settles mm. in. And I'm kind of at that point now. And I never thought I'd say that with this with this franchise because I've always worn my heart on my sleeve with, with a storyline. And now I, I feel like I can't really get behind the characters the way it was handled and and the idea that you just put forward is is i like that better than what we saw in the movie well here's a, really here's you the know? thing though like when you look at the films that that have been that could have been successful this film cost i think between 185 and two, the product, production budget of 185 million all right so with marketing and everything worldwide you're probably looking at between 300 and 350 million budget um it's gonna mm-hmm. make nowhere near that like this has killed it this is the franchise dead like you know but Yep. Um, the thing is, when you look at the films that have, have been good, so the first Deadpool film, uh, directed by Tim Miller, mm-hmm. right, so to stream in, was around between 60 and 65 million, okay, production budget, and made an absolute, you know, a couple of hundred million, quite a few hundred million, but it was small, it relied on its characters and its humour, like, it, it lent into, it really leaned into what, we, what it was all about. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. The recent Joker movie, you know, it had a production budget, I think, of something close to a hundred, but still not massive yeah. in this day and age. And it just lent into the fact of like, yeah, you're going to go in and watch a, sort of like a you know mm-hmm. a, an eighty an early seventies sorry late seventies character piece that just happens to be about the Joker with you know with, mm-hmm. with and it's going to be centered around a single performance. Fine, I'm happy mm-hmm. with that. I enjoyed it. It's making back all the money. Well done. Yep. This film, they lent into the wrong things. They lent into T2. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. they lent into the superhero franchises. And they lent into the Fast and the Furious. They went, all right, what this franchise is all about is big explosions and mm-hmm. um, you know big set pieces and big guns. And yep. everyone's gone, yes. Because James Cameron probably said that's, that's where it's gone. That's where the money was. That's where the studios were heading. Mm-hmm. When what they should mm-hmm. have done is lent into the claustrophobic, especially if you're looking for the chasing, mm-hmm. the claustrophobic horror of the first one, and actually yeah. had it so that so there are no keep the Rev Nine like it's a fantastic design and concept, but have no uh, machine protector because that's terrifying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know they lent. I just think they lent into the wrong things, and there was decisions. Clear, yeah. There's clearly wrong decisions at every turn. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's just just how I feel about it. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree with that. You know, it, it's 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 a shame because this could have been a real uh, franchise starter in some ways. This could have really kind of gotten it back on the ground, and it hurts because I'm a longtime fan, and I kind of see it uh, basically going the way of well, you know what, the next step is going to be it's going to have to be a hard reboot, basically. You know, not just a soft one, not just a restart mm. or a requel or whatever they're going to call it. They're going to, I feel like really the next step, they really can't go any further with this story. They, they're they going to have to redo everything from scratch. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and I don't, I, I don't even know if I want to see that, you know, it, and it, <laughs> won't, this point. it probably won't come for a 15 years. This is the last you will right. see of the Terminator on screen for, I think at least 15 years. Um, mm-hmm. but the thing is, again, like you say, they could have, when, when you look at what happens in this film, and let's talk about Arnie being in the film, because like, sort of post Arnie coming in, entering the film, like it it steps up a notch, mm-hmm. doesn't it? Like that's the when you get the bigger set pieces, 
and that's mm-hmm. where the money's gone. Like you know, there's a, like you say, there's an aeroplane chase. Um, there's all the stuff at the dam. There's a a, a, a Humvee that sort of parachutes down from a a, a jet. Like all oh, that feels so unnecessary. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. Yep. Um, but I enjoy Arnie in this film. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts about Arnie as the T eight hundred in this film? I, I'm a I'm a big Arnie fan, uh, at least with growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was, of course, looking forward to seeing him appear in this movie as, as back as the T-800. Um, but something to think about is that this is the same character that killed John at the start mm-hmm. of the movie, right? And, and I'm sure that could be argued for the what we call the T-850 from Rise of the mm-hmm. Machines, the third Terminator film, because that machine also was the one to assassinate mm. John. Uh, in a different context, but it's the same kind of thing. And I wasn't nearly as bothered with the, with, with that aspect because going back to T3, as much as it hate it gets by fans, uh, I'm not one of them, is that by the end, y- you realize that John has a mission to, to fulfill and he's not alone. Kate is at his side and she is often his superior in some ways, especially after he dies, she takes over mm. the leadership. So it's not like some, some male chauvinistic uh, fantasy or whatever, but it's uh, it's one of those things where you have... John now has the knowledge that in 30 years time, he's going to die. He needs to die for him and his wife to be protected. Yeah. And I think that's a great hook. Mm. And it just has to be like, he, he knows the date and time that he's going to get murdered. And um, there was actually a video game that came out to tie in with mm-hmm. T3 that showed that where it showed him like an old John, an older John. And then the Arnie comes in and he goes, it is time. And he blows him away. And it was like, it was, it was, it wasn't well done because it was older uh, consoles and stuff like that. But it was, it's an interesting premise. Now you have Arnie in this one, as much as I was looking forward to seeing him in this, I just don't think that, was necessary i don't think it was handled Mm -hmm. well i mean you have i mean there are moments that are exciting about this you know like we have uh the terminator saying well you know it's kind of like you know feeling no love should be a benefit and it's not like certain moments they're like okay that's kind of interesting but you go back to how they're supposed to be they're not supposed to be remorseful there's no pity there's all these things that we learn about the machines that you know now that his mission is over, he starts a family. And it's like, the more I think about that concept, it, it the more it gets under my yeah, skin. The, the, you know? This is the thing I had with this, with the introduction. Again, like, I enjoy Arnie in the film. I think, you know, they lean into the jokes. The thing about T3 we said about before, like, they lean into some of the jokes. And some of the jokes are fine. Like, there's funny, like, to find out he, mm-hmm. he runs a drapery company and then there's some of the, you know, the things around that. Fine. Like, when, when Sarah actually shoots him, he's like, no, I've got to explain this to Helen, whatever her name is. Um, Right. But there's this thing about what a Terminator is. So he has to go in and blend in. That's the idea. And But it's a learning computer. Like The idea is it's a learning computer. But the thing mm-hmm. is, like the first one, that one that was sent back in T2, had been reprogrammed by the Resistance to protect John. So it's, it, it, right. it was learning to feel emotions for John, or feel something for John, because that mm-hmm. helped its mission. That's yeah. the point. That was the point of it. Like it had a mission. That was the, what it was doing. So the excuse they give this one is, well, once he killed John, he didn't have a mission anymore. So he went and did all these things to blend in. And you're still thinking, like, I'm still thinking, it- <laughs> you're still a little public. Like surely finding a cabin somewhere in the woods because you don't need to really eat, you don't need to sleep. So having a cabin, there are better ways of like, running, a, opening a business. That's weird. As a Terminator, do you know what I mean? It's sort of like I, it, it, it's played it for is. laughs. It, it's meant to be a, a because he he doesn't open a gun range. He opens a uh, a, drapery a drapery business, and he and he waxes philosophical about the types of drapes in a room. So I mean, it's played for laughs. And, and honestly, there are times where the Terminator is used as a punching be- as as a punchline yes. in the last couple movies he's putting on the stupid glasses instead he says talk to the hand it's it's used for now there there's a proper way to do it where the humor comes at the terminator's expense but it's not done it, it it how this does it like this kind of like to me it kind of like un- undoes the fierceness of the character you know because he's he's got a family life and and someone online some wise guy online was like 
I now I want to see a whole TV series with having Arnie and the family and him trying to find increasingly, uh, you know, more advanced reasons why he can't be intimate that night. Oh yeah, and there's more, a, more confusing yeah, things. There's a, sit, there's a, sit, <laughs> there's a yeah, there's a sitcom here where you know it, it, it's a, it's a sitcom where like you say, so like, honey, I'm home. And like you know, ex- yeah, he goes to P- he goes to PTA meetings. He goes to parent teacher meetings, and he's just like trying to blend in with that. It's just like you know, oh my god, jokes where they're, yeah, they're, he joins so, the I mean, bowling it, team and smashes all the pins, and you know, like <laughs> it's just yeah, it's 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 funny, it's fun. I think I honestly, I honestly, honestly think the biggest issue is they sort of they don't know what to do with Arnie because yes yep that, you know he's older and they don't feel that he can be a legit threat like there are bits in this film right he is there are moments when he looks great like there are bits when he's doing stuff that he, he looks great fine i'm happy when he's yep. like fighting the rev mm-hmm. nine and doing stuff like and some of the concepts about like when he has like the flesh ripped off his ha- his arm and stuff later in the, in this in some mm-hmm. of the fights looks great and you start to re- it starts to reveal right. the terminal but this whole thing of him sort of obsessing over not having an objective and so he reached out to Sarah to give her one too is utter bullshit. Yeah. Because it's like, no, 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 no. You, it, even like in Skynet, if, you know, because he was obviously sent back by Skynet, Skynet is, is, a, is, a, is a hugely capable thinking computer. This is a massively advanced, mm-hmm. you know, AI system. And you're telling me it didn't give it secondary objectives. <laughs> right. It's rubbish. It would go, oh, I've killed John. What have I got to do now? Oh, Kate Brewster. Da, 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 da. Or go into hiding. Right. That's it. Because mm-hmm. his flesh becomes a little bit um, irrelevant at this point. Because he could just go into flesh and yeah. let, the, let the flesh rot and then come out in 2029 and be like, I'm here as a robot. <laughs> like, it, it makes no... <laughs> makes no it's, <sighs> I don't know. It... That's when he should say, "Honey, I'm home." Yeah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> when he's he's just a he's just a rotted T800. Honey, I'm home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That that would be great. It, yeah. It just, I don't know. Yeah. It just it feels really contrived. Um, and again, like I say, you know, the action. I, I keep going back to the fact that like the film in, as, as, as itself is actually really good fun. Like the film is fun, mm-hmm. but it's fun in the same way that I said Hobbs and Shaw was fun. Like it's fun. Yeah. I had a great time mm-hmm. watching it. But it's not a Terminator mm-hmm. film. And, and you know what's funny? I said the same thing, and then I, I was wondering if that made sense or not, because I, I, I sort of thought the same thing. I I, I was wondering if uh, if it really was a Terminator movie. You know what I mean? So so I was just kind of... Uh, I feel I feel the same way, yeah. you know? So it, it's funny you said that, you know? Because it, it, is it a Terminator movie? Yes. But is it also not a Terminator movie? I think that could also be argued, you know, because it, it, it feels like it in some ways and it feels totally different in others. It's a Terminator film made by the Deadpool director in an era of the Fast and the Furious. Yes. That's yeah. what... It kind of felt like a Transformers movie at times, you know? I'm like, what am I watching? Yeah, that's another thing, <laughs> you know? yeah. It, it, it felt like it had to sort of, like, escalate things to a point where... Yes. You yep. know, and... Uh, I don't know, it... You know, let, I mean, let's get into it then. Let's sort of get into recommendations, and we'll round this out. Actually, we've been talking quite a while about it, but so you know, let's see. Would you? What would you give this out of ten? If you had to give it a score, uh, this may sound harsh, but I would give it a three out of ten. Oof! What did you? What did you... Um, because because yeah, I, honestly, because because some of the action is is good, mm-hmm. right? But. I can't. I can't say it's a great action movie because, unlike T two, of course, because some of the action I thought was awful. Mm. Um, there's there's a sequence in this movie that is, I honestly feel is dumber than anything I've ever seen in the series. And that includes talk to the hand. <laughs> I need a vacation. The thumbs up onto the lava. And you mentioned it earlier, Scott. It's when the Humvee. First of all, the airplane sequence is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the Humvee sequence, the hum- Humvee sequence underwater, where mm. it's like it's almost like driving kind of underwater, and it's getting attacked. Like I, I'm laughing out loud in the theater at a film that's not a comedy and a franchise that I've been attached to since I was a kid. Yeah, you know what I mean. That's yeah. like that's not good. If you could, and and I, I turned to my wife and I said, "What is going on?" <laughs> I said, "She says I don't know." <laughs> when I saw that, two things came to my mind. The first one was the A Team movie. Um. Could okay, they yep, do something yep, similar yep. with a tank? 
And then, and then, That's and right. then the Fast and the Furious, which is one of their entrances in that film, is they have they parachute the cars down, and that's all I could think was like, mm-hmm. this is this is ridiculous. Like, none of this is necessary. Like that whole mm-hmm. plane sequence becomes unnecessary because it's escaping with the EMP that they've got. Um, right. And and then it, that gets shot, so you're like, oh, that was pointless. <laughs> like I, I I don't understand yeah. the point of it. Like it doesn't become part of the chase. It never feels like the chase never mm-hmm. feels desperate enough that they're like, we've got to get away, we've got to get away, we've got to take off. Like, it just feels like, and, right, right. And here's the next stunt we've got lined up. Um, exactly. That's a, that's a great point. The other thing is, you know, the guy who gives them the EMP, r- yeah. random mil- uh, military person who somehow knows Sarah yeah. Connor. Why isn't he yeah. Miles Dyson's son? And that's what I was thinking too when I first saw him. I'm like trying to look at the name on his badge. I'm like, nope, it's not him. That's so should you know, that, that, that been, so should have been Danny, Danny Dyson. Th- like, you know, um, that sh- that should have been. It, bath- it blew my mind that it wasn't. I was like, that's the easiest Easter egg you could have had, <laughs> and you blew it. Well, here, maybe maybe they were thinking if they were going back one film to to Terminator Genesis, even though it doesn't exist right yeah. anymore. Um, uh, despite the fact that I really think that the old man or anything was actually handled better in that movie, believe it or not, than this one, because I, I would, I would believe as horrible as Genesis is in a lot of ways, I would believe uh, a T-800 living solitary for the most part, instead of having a family, like and just, just biding his time, letting his skin get back, uh, letting it little planning and getting weapons yes. and plotting instead of what happened in this movie, which totally is like agree. crazy to say, but I would, I would definitely do that. But, but the point I was making was that Danny Dyson was a character in Genesis. They had him be; he was one of the developers the, yes. of the was, new was, uh, was a, Skynet uh, or whatever. Scientist. Yeah, I agree. So, so maybe they were trying to avoid that, but I don't know. Yeah. <sighs> the, yeah, it just feels like they had ambitions to do more films, but they should have done a self-contained film, and they should have escalated. Like this should have been a small self-contained film that could have escalated up to something. With the with the sequels, like mm-hmm. establish your base first and then build up, but blew it. Mm-hmm. Where yeah. would you where yeah. would you put it if you had to rank them? Then let's do it. Let's, before we really we, we sort of we go out there, let's rank the films. So T one, T two, T three, Salvation, Genesis, and Dark Fate. What order do you put those in from from best to worst? From best to worst. Mm. Okay, so uh, I would say. And it goes back and forth, you know. But I would say since I spent more time in my youth uh, investing in in Terminator Two: Judgment Day, mm-hmm. um, I would I would put probably T two first, mm-hmm. um, though, I, and, and T one a very close second. I think both of those films are interchangeable if you were to make a list. Mm-hmm. But I would say T uh, two would be first for me. Uh, T one would be second because I think it's just legendary. Mm-hmm. And um, and fans may disagree, but I I would say T three would round out that list as the third one. Um, a lot of people say, well, it doesn't exist anymore, <laughs> and it's worthless, and it's ridiculous. And one thing that I found pretty interesting in the last week, uh, reading articles about this f- film, is people in the message boards and comments are saying, Terminator 3, I, I, you know, they're saying, uh, T3, I forgive you. You know what I mean? <laughs> like they're kind of going back and saying that they, that they kind of were too harsh on it back in the day. Yeah. And even though it's nowhere near as great as the first couple, you could watch one, two, and three as a self-contained story. Mm-hmm. And by the end of T3, he's now accepted the leadership role. He has, uh, uh, his, his wife by his side and they're facing the future. They know what's going to happen. And you could literally shut off the series and be done with yeah. it. Yeah. Because in this, in, in this day and age, unfortunately, Scott, is that fans, the more they make the movies, uh, fans, even though they want more movies, it's a lot of the newer sequels don't live up to the originals or sometimes ruin the originals. Yes. So fans nowadays have to choose in their minds when the series ended, mm. uh, when the series died. So it's like, okay, there's 12 Halloween movies. I only watched the first six yeah. or what? You know what I mean? So it's like we, we, it's you have to like in this day and age. You either live, you know, die a hero, or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. You know what I mean, <laughs> yeah. so to speak. And it's one of those things where, and I think the series has gotten to that point where it is now done. I, that. I, I, um, I so one, two, yeah. So the first three, I would keep in, in the top three. There, um, I would say hmm, this is a tough one, Scott. So f- four, I, I would put next. Uh, Oh my goodness! I I can't believe I'm saying this. I would put Terminator Genesis as the fourth best 
Terminator movie that in my book. And the reason why I'm saying that is because it's it's a dumb movie that kind of knows it's a dumb movie. Yeah. And I, I know that sounds ridiculous, and I know it's that movie is like the most hated of all time or whatever, <laughs> but um, T, T4, I think, had great um, potential. It had some really awesome elements, but rewatching it recently kind of changed my mind on it where that I, I now have less affinity to it, despite the fact that they did something different, Scott. Mm. They went to the future war, and I gave them massive credit for that, but the the execution was poor in my book and it was a huge missed opportunity so uh, it sounds crazy to say but I'm, I'm putting Genesis just above T4 um, in that regard and and fans may even be mad at me at this I'm putting this new one probably as, as my least favorite unfortunately you know and, and that's not something I wanted to say going into this podcast I really uh, I went in with an open mind I was totally open to it and when the film was over I turned to the missus and I said Tell me your thoughts and don't let don't tell me what you think I want to hear because I just want to hear it from you as a fan have been almost as long as me my wife has been and she kind of told me the things that basically we've been talking about in this yeah. episode you know she kind of felt the same way that things did, that, you know John's death wasn't earned you know what I mean it really wasn't uh, it was there but we it didn't earn that uh, so that we can move the story forward with the new characters so that's just my take on it. I mean, I, I'm really kind of frustrated with the direction right now. And, and I'm sort of like, uh, I'm the, I'm the least of a fan that I've been in a long time. Well, and that's, and that's a shame, you know? Yeah. That's real. Sh- well, how about, how about you, Scott? How, uh, no, the, how about the, you? The, Enough about the, me. How about you? The first two yeah. are the same. Like, exactly the same. Like T2 is definitely the best film uh, in this, but it's very, very closely followed by T1. Like those two are so, so good together. It's incredible. Uh, and like you say, they're interchangeable depending on my, on my mood at times. Like sometimes I will think that one is better. Um, sure. The drop off then is quite substantial, regardless of what comes next. Yes. Um, and yeah. the problem I have is is really that, uh, as you say, what rounds out the story better? Um, mm-hmm. And I find, I find for me. Um, it is somewhere between T3 and Dark Fate that comes in next. Um, and the reason yeah. I say that is I, I totally agree. Like we had our problems. Well, I had my problems when we talked about them with T3. I, you know, I find the TX sure. to be a bit ridiculous. I think some of the story contrivances are daft. Um, however, it sort of redeems itself with the third act and the fact that it has the it has the cojones to actually go and destroy the world. Like fair play. Like it, it mm-hmm. you know, it pulls up with a, with a sort of quite stunning ending. Um, Dark Fate for me had some really good elements in it like I really enjoy Gabriel Luna I really enjoy Sarah, uh, Linda Hamilton uh, I think Mackenzie Davis brings mm-hmm. something different to this uh, you know I think there are really good elements in this that that you know I would watch again I, w- I would watch this again so I'd probably uh, in mm-hmm. the last couple of weeks I've probably sort of flipped and flopped on these at this point I would probably say to yourself T3 so I can have a complete trilogy closely followed by Dark Fate then I would say it's mm-hmm. Salvation. Uh, again, a bit of a drop. The potential's there. There's so much sure. there that they could be doing. But when you watch it again, it's like... I, yeah. It's one of those things when you watch it, but I, you know, it's easy to criticise from the outside. And, and you know that's sort of the point of the podcast. But mm-hmm. it's there's so much potential there that they blow it again. And the, the, my biggest problem, the that's more I right. think about it, my biggest problem is Christian Bale with that film. Like I don't buy him yes. as John Connor in any way, shape or form. <laughs> Um, and then and then right at the bottom for me, um, because fuck Genesis, <laughs> it <laughs> is Terminator Genesis. Um, I really can't. I can't watch that film. I don't know why, but there's there's just something about the film that just irritates me. I think it's badly cast. I think um, mm-hmm. I agree with your point about the fact that Arnie waiting and stockpiling weapons and machinery for for you know however many years makes more sense. Like, that totally makes more sense. But the whole uh, reveal with John Connor and you know Daft, um, yeah, app s- yeah, Skynet totally. and all that kind of stuff, it it just bugs me. It's it it felt like it wanted to be a modern film and it was just dreadful. So, yeah, that's for me. T T two T one, depending on my mood. T three Dark Fate Salvation and then Genesis right at the bottom. Well, and here's one last question for you: Do do you consider Terminator Dark Fate? The true third entry in the series, like like, would you forsake any of the other crappy films that came before it and just say the trilogy is 
one, two, and Dark Fate. And that's the real direction of, of, of the story. If I, What do you think? It's difficult. No, it's not, because it's not the end of a trilogy. That's the problem I have with it. Like, this is clearly the start of a story. It's a bridging film. You Like we said, it's a, it, this was supposed mm-hmm. to be passing the torch. So you could have had, like, if, if, if anything, you could have had, like, one and two, Dark Fate, and then... And then two others that sort of, and that's the end of us. So you could have had like this really interesting time saga that says actually mm-hmm. both one and two still exist. And then this time shift, weird time shift thing happened. And then you have, so if that was one, two, and three, then you have four and five that round out the end of that second thing. That would have been really interesting that you started in right. one timeline and ended in another and they're all valid. But mm-hmm. this is not the end of a trilogy. So no, if you want a decent trilogy, like a round up trilogy, it's got to be one, two, and three. Mm-hmm. And, and it's one of those series, Scott, that, that you know, anytime they make a new movie, it in a way r- kind of does an alternate uh, reality kind of thing anyway, mm. because you're, they're always changing details. There's always stuff that happens. Some characters know more than others. It's it, it just it, it's really weird like that, where it's like, OK, so if you like T3, great. A lot of people don't. Some people do, you know, but it's, you know, 2032. Things get postponed and things get shifted yeah. and things get pushed down. And, and change and everything. It's just like, so you could honestly go, well, you know what? I watched T1 through 4, and then I shut off the series. And that's fine. The, mm. and, and because every time they make a new one, it, and that's the only one that really doesn't deal with time travel. Mm. You know, that's really, I mean, it's in a, there there are time gaps, but that's more of a, a normal passage of time. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it, it's, you know, if you're a diehard fan and you're into science fiction, you could easily write off some of the storylines, and that's and and that's totally a prerogative. You know, like I said, some people love this film, some people really hate this film, and 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 I I'm a person who really wanted to. I I gave us a fair chance, and I was trying to ignore the things that were going to bother me. But uh, the more I thought about it over the last week, it kind of really kind of got to me, and it, and it had nothing to do with what Tim Miller probably thought fans were going to hate, which was three female leads who were capable yeah. and strong. Terminator has always had that from the beginning. E- even in part one, when Sarah was, was a young girl, by the end she's galvanized. Yeah. She's the mother of the future by the end. You know, it's it, so ever since. I mean, hell, look at Kate Brewster. If you like T three and T four, you know more so in the third one. Kate Brewster is be, because she saves John's butt more than he does half the yes. time because he's a mess. She says it. You're a mess. You know, and she saves his ass countless times. And she has to always be like kind of the voice of reason. She's the audience. So I don't buy this whole, Woke if you thing. don't like the movie, yeah. you, you're you, you, right, right. It's If you don't like the movie, you just, you, you're not okay with women being leads. That's, it makes me so mad because it's a cop out, you know, make a better movie and I'm in, you know what I'm saying? And, and in a, in a way, what the, the last thing I'll say is what they did with John in this one reminded me, speaking of a Cameron uh, franchise, Remember Aliens and and uh, mm, Newt, Carrie Han and really Aliens. Good point. Yeah. In the very next one, they killed her off in, in the first two minutes. That's right. Same yeah. thing with Hicks. Yeah, John you know? Connor got newted. <laughs> That's exactly yeah, yeah. The one difference is that even though Newt was a very uh, key figure at the end of Aliens, is that you know she needed to be saved. She was the whole reason why Sigourney went back into the lair to save her. And what what a gut punch! I felt the same kind of gut punch in this one. Mm. The only difference was that even though Newt was a, a great character, she wasn't the pit the linchpin of the franchise. Being part of the Connor family, she wasn't no. that pivotal. If she died, it would have been horrible. But and. But it, it doesn't nullify the entire series thus far in in some ways, and and fortunately for me, this just the opening of this just prevented me from fully enjoying it like I wanted to. Yeah. I I really wanted to love this one, you know, and it's a shame I couldn't get into it, you know. Well, Brian, I have to say it's been a really good conversation, and in fact, talking it through has helped me sort of, get, like you said, the word good word galvanize some of my thoughts around around this film so i appreciate that even if you know i didn't no pro- really appreciate nope, the film no problem scott um no problem scott I, I, i'll be i'll be the dr silverman anytime you want yeah. so. <laughs> but Brian, thank you very no much worries. for this all this for the whole retrospective it's been an absolute blast going back and seeing the terminator franchise and uh you know there may be another in the future at some point but we'll see yes and i wanted to thank the listeners too for for if, if you've stuck stuck around this whole time, we really appreciate it because we're, we're just two fans just kind of uh, deep diving into the mythology and uh, just having fun with it. So at the end of the day, they're just movies, man. You know, That's we just, just have fun with it. But we, we, we appreciate all the listeners, you know. We do indeed. Really do. All right, Brian, thanks very much. And uh, 
we'll catch up again soon, mate. We'll have a chat soon. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Another great 20th Century Geek episode. Thank you for listening. If you would like to get in contact to suggest topics for future shows or just chat about everything nerdy, you can email me at 20thCenturyGeek at gmail.com. That's 20thCenturyGeek at gmail.com. Or find me on social media, Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. Just search for 20th Century Geek. If you would like to support the show, please go on your podcast catcher and leave a five-star review. I would greatly appreciate it. It raises the show in the ranks and lets more people know about the podcast. If you want to show more support for the podcast, we do have an Amazon wish list. Just go on Amazon and search for 20th Century Geek and you will find a list of books that will help with research for future podcasts. And don't forget, we love second-hand books in 20th Century Towers. Once again, thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.